Hi there, and welcome to this Hall of Tyrannus podcast, which has been brought to you by the Tree of Life Foundation. My name is Johan Sneeman, and I'm your podcast host. So today on the podcast, I have the privilege to chat to Franz Struvig. Those of you who've had the opportunity to already have met Franz will know that he is passionate about people, technology, and business. Franz received his computer engineering degree from the University of Pretoria and started his career as an embedded software developer. After honing his skills for a couple of years, he decided to start a business where engineers could really express themselves. And as a result, Ikubu, a Stellenbosch-based tech company, was born. During his tenure as CEO of Ikubu, Franz also completed his MBA with the cum laude distinction at the University of Stellenbosch. And after crowdfunding the world's first bicycle radar called Backtracker in 2014, Ikubu was acquired by Garmin in 2015. Currently, France is busy helping tech startups to unlock their full potential. France, I think we should probably give our listeners the backstory, and that is that we actually started talking about this podcast interview in March of 2019 already. We both yeah. spoke. <laughs> we both spoke about April. We probably should have better defined it as April 2019, but here we are on the last day of April 2020. And we're probably going to speak about business unusual tonight. I think we had in mind to speak about business as usual back in 2019, but it's a privilege to have you and to be able to chat to you tonight. Thanks, Johan. The privilege is mine. Yeah, and that does show you what, uh, what this COVID pandemic has already done, what benefits it has <laughs> brought you. Exactly. <laughs> it, uh, it necessitated a global pandemic for me to eventually start this podcast series that we started talking about a year ago. So. There is a silver lining already, as you say. So uh, first off, how are you doing? How's your family doing amidst this global pandemic we find ourselves in, amidst the lockdown on the eve of level four, stage four? How are you guys doing? We are doing exceptionally well. We're really thriving. I've got a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old boy. And um, so even before lockdown, we started to, to do our own bit of lockdown because my wife um has as a chronic chronic myeloid leukemia so we always have to you know be mindful of exposing her so so we started quite early and um it's just been a very special time i mean we just to give you an idea mm. we, we started a vegetable garden so the boys are working in the vegetable garden every day they're doing dishes we're playing cricket every day uh, you know around sunset we have a huge cricket game going touches We've been doing karaoke. Saturdays is our cleaning day. So in the morning, we, we first meet with our neighbors in the street, everybody on their camping chairs, and then, then it's cricket. So, okay, not cricket, then it's cleaning. Yeah, so it's, it's, been, it's been awesome. And I've spent, uh, I think the time, family time has, has, been, has been really good. And um, also, you know, from a you know, from a spiritual perspective, it's it's been very humbling, and I think we feel we feel very small. And yeah, it was amazing. Passover was amazing to have the whole world in their homes. You know, it was a really special celebration. But as you can hear, I've got a lot to say, so <laughs> you have to stop me. Don't don't <laughs> let me run away with this. No, please, <laughs> you're allowed to run away with this. But um, I must. How, take... <laughs> how are you doing, Johan? So uh, France also doing very well. Family time is, is really amazing. Also um, have two boys in the house, but um, slightly younger than yours, two and four and a half. So the one's actually turning two in a few weeks time. Hopefully there'll be some sort of party. Otherwise we'll use Zoom mm -hmm. just to wave at the grannies and grandparents. But uh, yeah, so the house is busy. And um, at the end of the day, it feels like you know, the day is long, but we also know the years are short. So we try and treasure these moments. And um, it has really been amazing to spend a lot of time with them, to come out of the room where I try and work most of the time, to have an impromptu tea and, and rusk session with them, or an impromptu uh, touchy or soccer game on the small little patch of fake grass that we have. So, uh, so no, it's, uh, it's really, uh, it's, for us as a family, it's mm. been net positive. And yeah, spiritually as well, it was so special to know that with half of the rest of the world, during Passover, we're in our homes and mm. um, we actually, you know, it was so real thinking about what Passover is and what it means and where it comes mm. from and, and actually being in your home and uh, being able to plead and pray the blood of Jesus over your home and uh, 
goalposts. So uh, very special. So you've also you've really touched on it or alluded to uh, a lot of unexpected wins. But uh, just for interest sake, are there any other wins that came about as a result of being locked down? I think many people might have thought it would be a negative experience, but you've really touched on a lot of positives. Anything else? Yeah. So probably the biggest positive there was how the constraints of lockdown really um, fueled our creativity. And um, so, you know, you, you're not allowed to go to the shop and just quickly buy what you need. So we had to make deal with what we had. And, and we, we started building some really interesting stuff. So my, my nine-year-old wanted to build a go-kart and we don't have a DC motor that can, that can do that. You know? So we took apart a leaf blower, which has a, a 2000 watt AC motor. And so now starting to engineer around, how do we get that to run and taking some batteries of the, of the garage door. And uh, it was such fun, you know, and we built that and we, um, our Xbox, Every day we play like a little bit of uh, racing around lunch with boys, just before lunch, we race a bit. And, um, but we've got one with a steering wheel, looks like a steering wheel that you hold in the air. And the other one is a normal control and they have difficulty with a normal control. So we built a rig We're using a glue gun, using carton. What, is, what would that be? Uh, cardboard <laughs> maybe. Or... Cardboard, yeah. <laughs> So, and we built this thing where you, where you place the, the remote in and then you actually have a steering wheel that you can use and you've got a piece of string pulling it and, you know, a pedal for a proper, like a petrol and, and brake pedal and, and silly things like that. Um, and it was, it was just so liberating because there's no pressure to, you know, to build a product that is, that's going to sell or it's really just building something with what we have. And it's okay if we fail because we have a really good excuse for failing if we do. And, and we ended up making some really cool things. It's our list of, 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 of more things that we've, we've done, but that was, that was really a highlight for me so far. That's amazing. I don't know what I would have done if uh, my boys asked me to build a go-kart. I'm a way less DIY inclined. So <laughs> I probably would have phoned you and we would have had this session earlier in April, but it's awesome to hear that you guys have been keeping busy with whatever's well, at hand. You want, can I tell you a secret? Um, and I hope, I hope no, you won't tell this to anyone, but I suck at DIY <laughs> and I'm actually terrible with mechanical stuff. So for me, it's, this, this was also such a learning experience. And, and I always find you learn through, through doing, you know, and like building a pulley system with gears and seeing the effect of gears on that system. You can't, you, you know, if you haven't done it, you have no way of understanding that fully. So just don't tell anyone that i won't i won't our listeners <laughs> might hear about it but i won't tell anyone else <laughs> Ron, so yeah you touched on doing things now um and learning by doing so i'm just interested i think it was abram lincoln that said you know if you give me six hours to cut down a tree i'll use the first four hours to sharpen the saw and um what are some of the sharpening the saw things that um, you find that you're able to do in lockdown or that you started doing? Uh, maybe there's something, maybe not, but I'm just interested to, to find out from you. Yeah, so I'm, I'm doing a, a business course called Repurposing Business. And um, that's been really challenging. So it's, it's basically about getting into God's business. So really integrating work and um, and spiritual life and so that that's really challenged me and there's some good reading and um, and we're doing some group work over zoom every week so that's been great i've also read some books probably a, a life-changing book that i've read is called why we sleep i don't know if you've read that i should read it because uh, my wife always tells me i sleep way too little yeah this book really changed my my whole understanding about sleep. And um, so I can recommend it to everyone. It's, it's really also from, a, from a, a biblical perspective, you know, looking at the brain and looking how crazy it is that when we dream, we have this whole virtual reality thing going, you know, and, and how parts of our body gets disabled so we don't hurt ourselves. And, and from a computer science perspective, you look at that and you think we develop a system you know, that you can simulate, that you can 
basically have a learning system to transfer certain data to certain areas, reinforce certain learnings. And it's just mind blowing. But when you, when you read that book, you don't mess with sleep again. So for me, a big thing in this lockdown was actually to optimize my sleep. So I'm measuring my sleep every day. And I, I found that I'm not getting enough deep sleep. Uh, well, my wife gets amazing deep sleep. So I'm, I'm really pulling out all the stops to improve that. And an unfortunate stop is no alcohol at night. <laughs> like a, even a single beer at night really kills my, my deep sleep. But that, that's, that's been interesting. I think that's quite fundamental. Sounds like an amazing book. And I don't, if I tell my wife about it, I'll get it for my birthday on the 1st of August. I should probably do that and at least my, have my birthday present lined up. But uh, it really mm. does um, sound like a book that I need to put on my list. The course you mentioned, repurposing business, I mean, doing a course like that in a time such as this, it's probably yeah. amazing. Are there any like yeah. nuggets that have stood out thus far that you just like, this is like a word in season for how I need to look at business in general or my life or integrating the two, anything you yeah. can share with us? Yeah, I must say something that, that, that really struck home was the idea that, you know, we are all so risk averse now because the messaging is stay at home, uh, you know, cough in a certain way, cover your face. Um, so it's all about risk management and we run the risk oh, to, to, to stay with the risk analogy that, that we become so risk averse in every part of our lives, also in business. But um, if you think about it, God actually wants us to take risk. God wants us to go out on a limb. Mm. You know, he wants us to, to walk in faith. And so we have to be careful to not allow this, this risk mentality to seep into the rest of our uh, work life and, and what, whatever we do, because ultimately we, we live by faith and not simply just by some logical argument around what a bug is going to do to you. Not to downplay it, but, but ultimately God is in control. So, but it's, it's, it's for me, it's, it's been very challenging and it just so happened that during this time, a lot of, a lot of the businesses I'm working with has some, has had some challenges, which, which has really forced me to, to walk a route of faith in business. And that is something that is, that, um, that's quite exciting, but I'm embracing it. Yeah. So taking, taking calculated risks now, partnering with God in doing that and, and being really awake. You know, we have, this is a time, an exciting time, actually, an unprecedented time in the world. And, and we have to be awake as Christians. That's such a great reminder, I think, just to remember that we have been called to cast our bread upon the waters. Because we have hope within us that's yeah. eternal, where the world might come to a complete standstill and fret and become anxious. We know that even if this is the final act, then we're okay. And uh, we have the responsibility to live out a testimony and affect transformation. Not because of us, but because of who's in us. So um, the, that old cliche of faith is spelled R-I-S-K. I think it's so true. I mean, it's a cliche mostly because it's true, right? So that's how things mm. become cliches. So I love that insight and reminder, just to not let the media and fake news and uh, the world's anxiety engulf you. I did actually at one point, probably about a like week and a half ago, have, have my lockdown blues moment where, where I was a bit discouraged and um, I was actually so negative about like what the politicians are doing and I got I had that moment where I was like very self-righteous and like knowing better than everybody and um, but I was I was I was quickly humbled by my wife and uh, and I just came to realize again you know that we have to be so careful in this time to be drawn away because we're praying for our politicians. You know, we, uh, we should be standing in the gap. We, we shouldn't be looking for every opportunity to criticize and basically lose our peace. You know? So that takes a lot of conscious effort, I think, to, to 
to prime yourself like that because the moment that you turn on your social media you start talking to the wrong people you're going to be bombarded with negativity no that's that's for sure and i've i've had my lockdown blues or lockdown fatigue the last couple of days actually <laughs> so uh, this is a word in season for me just listening to you again and being reminded of that there's one thing that i was reminded of this week is that in complexity it's very seldom black and white it's uh, it's very much gray and there's a lot of things that need to uh, be considered it's more principle based it's less rules based so um there's a lot more space and freedom to do things and try new things, but also, I mean, people will make mistakes. As you said earlier, this is a once in a century, once in a lifetime type event. It's unprecedented times. And um, as you rightly mentioned, our leadership, I think they're doing great, great work and um, really a great job. I have shuddered now and again at the thought of previous regime taking us uh, through COVID-19. So I'm very happy and thankful that we have the leaders we currently have in place um, in the various positions. You touched on the, the companies that you um, that you get to engage with. I mean, you deal with startup companies, tech companies on, on a weekly basis and on a daily basis. So um, I'm interested to hear what is the, the key impact? There might be more than one that you currently see when you engage with these companies that they experience as a result of this global pandemic, lockdown, and the various uncertainties and unknown unknowns that everyone's juggling at the moment. So, mostly, uh, it's been quite positive. So, there were some companies that I thought, one company specifically, that I thought are really going to have, have it tough with, with this pandemic. But somehow God just changed things around for them. And it actually had the complete opposite. You know, they, they focused, the doors are open for them. And so, really, supernaturally, things have happened. Um, other entrepreneurs have been so resourceful. Um, as an example, my brother-in-law, his factory was about to close. Not quite, but they were, they were in really in dire straits. They were going to lay off a lot of people. And he came up with this concept of a hands-free sanitize, hand sanitizer stand. So you basically step on a thing and then you know, it squirts out some hand sanitizer. Very simple, easy to make. And um, so the product is called Steri Stand. And, you know, we set up a, a website in a day and just got the, got the thing going and, and the sales just started rocketing, you know, so I don't know where it is now, but early on, it was like 500 units a day that he was selling. So that's really been my, my experience, you know, of, of companies grabbing opportunities, making opportunities. Um, I've had a lot of, a lot of people talk to me about importing certain PPE equipment. So that kind of thing is happening. We um, in talks about developing certain screening mechanisms. And you know, I don't want to, I don't want to give anything away there, but you can just imagine this, this is so much opportunity. So I think for the small kind of companies that, that I typically deal with, it's, it's not been that bad. You know, they, they've been pretty nimble. And I work with a, with an agriculture company called AgriMotion. And um, the beauty there is this has really necessitated or speeded up a lot of the digital transformation, which, which again is, is, is wonderful. So for the companies that are able to, to, to withstand this you know, and, and, and survive this, I think there, there's going to be a lot, of, um, a lot of benefits and a lot of resilience and character that's, that's, that comes out of it. But... I also know that there are loads of companies that are going to battle and, you know, so I've tried to also support where I can, but it is just inevitable. It's, it's going to be, it's going to be a real disaster. And um, yeah, that, that is where I think our big responsibility is going to come in, you know, picking up the pieces after this. No, I think that's that's very true, and I and I do want to delve into a post COVID nineteen world with you a little bit later. Mm -hmm. But you just mentioned something that uh, triggered a conversation that I listened to a while ago during lockdown, and uh, the uh, investor on the on that podcast was uh, mentioning the fact that in a time such as this, companies need to focus on cash. Number one, number two, they need mm -hmm. to become twice as creative in times such as these, because this is a time where you can really leapfrog your, your competition. And then lastly, and very importantly, especially as a Christian business leader, you want to love on your people and remember that 
there are real people and real families mm -hmm. behind each and every business. But I want to drill into mm -hmm. that second point. And I think you're the perfect person to speak to on that creativity, innovation. How do you position yourself in this type of world to be twice as creative as, as per usual, twice as innovative as a company, as a person? What, for example, helped your, your brother-in-law, I think you mentioned, to think of a handless sanitizer? I mean, what are the little small tweaks, little life hacks that yeah. um, we should focus on? Well, what, what is the saying? Necessity is the, the mother of all invention. I think for him, that, that was the case. So a lot of people, I think, in desperation are forced to, to take chances to be creative. And that is, that is also a good thing. You know, we sometimes need to be just pushed out of the comfort zone a little bit. In terms of a life hack, I really like Simone Geertz. I don't know if, you, if, I, if I pronounce that correctly. She's an inventor in the U.S., that invents useless objects or useless <laughs> machines, useless robots. And um, you, should, you should check her out. It's, it's really good. She's, she started making like, for instance, a plastic hand that would wake you up. And that hand, you know, when it's time to wake up, it would just slap you through the face like multiple times. Or um, another thing I need. Like a, <laughs> a machine that automatically brushes your, your teeth, but it's like a useless machine, you know. She, she says zero dentists um, would recommend it. You know, zero out of 100 dentists. But her principle for me is, is beautiful where it's basically that if you want to do new things, let's say you want to build a robot, there's so much to learn that you are bound to fail and you are bound to make lots of mistakes. And so most people never move forward because they're so afraid of failure. And, and her philosophy then was she's going to make stuff that sucks. Okay? She's going to make machines that don't work because there's no way she can fail at that. And that doing that just took all the pressure off her and allowed her to actually become very creative. So the stuff she started making was actually really cool simply because she didn't have the pressure on her of trying to make something perfect. And, and I, really, I experienced that at home with the kids building stuff. So I, I could recommend for, for anybody that, that really wants to be creative, do things that you haven't done. Um, get a 3D printer. Play around with a glue gun and cardboard. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but do things. Don't wait for the perfect day or don't think you have to, do, to have every, or, you know, all your ducks in a row before something happens. Or before you're allowed to creatively express yourself. That's powerful. Yeah. I just attest to that um, whole notion of people not trying things because they, they're worried that they might fail, they, they fear failure, they want something to be perfect before they start. It could be 50% of the reason I waited a year to start a <laughs> podcast. So uh, <laughs> is it just as easy as saying I'm, I'm, I'm fine with failure? Or, I mean, is there something, I mean, how do you make that paradigm shift from I don't want to fail or I want it to be perfect to let, let me just play around and enjoy it and do it. Mm. You did touch on it, but being someone that yeah. uh, constantly <laughs> faced that question, I'd be interested to just hear yeah. your take on that. Yeah. So you have to reduce the cost of failure. And so that is where typically the agile methodology comes in or lean startup. Um, a friend and I did, over a period of three months, we, we did a new product every week. I think that was, that was in 2019. And um, the reason that we did that was knowing that we're going to take just a week to develop this product means that the cost of failure is very small. You know, so we are giving ourselves permission to invest a week in developing this product that we want to use for ourselves. And we're going to learn 90% of what we're ever going to know about this topic in this week. And by the end of this week, you know, we're going to have something we can show people. And, you know, so we've, we've just reduced our the, the potential cost immensely, you know. But if we said we're going to invest a year or two in, in developing this product, you know, take a risk on that, then failure will also have a really big cost. I guess that is, that is sort of so, uh, obvious, but, but it's not always that obvious to an inventor who really wants to get everything right before it goes to market. 
it's obvious, but it's also, it's not obvious. So it's, it's very good to just speak about it and practically lay into it because I think we sometimes conceptually think, oh, we shouldn't be afraid of it, but then we are still. But I think it's a very practical tip to just um, reduce the cost of failure. You know that mm -hmm. after one week, you're going to, you're going to put everything into knowing everything you can about being a barista. And at the end of the week, if you, if you don't make the perfect flat white, then uh, it's not the end of the world, but you 90% further down and along the road mm -hmm. than you would have been and actually was yeah. a week ago. So um, I think that's a tip that I'm taking away from this. Thank now, what's, what's also beautiful about that approach is you harness peak passion. Mm. You know, so when you start something that first week, you're normally super passionate and so you've got a lot of energy. You can really make a dent in something. Also, if you know you have a limited amount of time, you tend to put a lot more into it. But if you say this thing is sort of open-ended, you, know, you don't know when you're actually going to go to market, then, then it can really drag on and people can, um, can end up not putting, you know, you can't sustain like a serious amount of energy for such a long time. So people will automatically start to slack off early on and you become less productive. So I would say, you know, hit something really hard and um, after a week i mean even after a weekend if it's okay if you don't continue with it but also make stuff for yourself you know you should be the customer <laughs> that is the best kind of product if you're really crazy about that product you're making it for yourself then just maybe <laughs> other other people will also like it you know? but but making something for other people if you're not the customer is just a recipe for disaster. Sure. Lowering the cost of failure, hitting it hard, and making sure that you will be the number one customer and a fan of the product you're creating, whatever it is, and also honoring that peak passion. I think that's super helpful. I must say that there are just so many good resources that I cannot even start to credit. You know, if I say something that someone else has said, it is because someone else said it. Like Paul Graham is, is such a source of wisdom, you know, at Y Combinator. So don't, don't mistake my, my wisdom for original wisdom. This is a lot of, a lot of uh, reading and blogging, uh, you know, reading blogs and listening to podcasts and taking this stuff in. That's perfectly fine. I think we live in a a world of podcasts and uh, blogs out there and great resources and great wisdom on certain topics we're interested in. Mm. Fran, so um, I think I did allude earlier to it, but I constantly think about this notion of there not being too many rules that will stand the test of COVID and many of them have fallen to the ground. We're in frontier territory, almost a little bit wild west. It's, it's more a principle-based environment we find ourselves in. I don't know if, if you can, re if that resonates with you, but if so, are there any principles that, that you've been reminded of and or just being convicted to reinforce in order to just steer and navigate through the, the daily COVID-19 and lockdown waters, things that have, you've been reminded about or have become more important, you know, principles that we can apply wherever we are? Sure. Well, I think people... You know the importance and the beauty of people has 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 crept up on me. You know, I've, I miss my friends. I miss my family. When a week ago, the, uh, someone was rummaging through my dustbin, and you know, I just wanted to have a conversation with with this guy, and I brought him a bunch of food, and I just you know this is another person, <laughs> and. A guy doing a delivery, you know, we get into a discussion because, you know, you're so interested in, in, in this person. So maybe, you know, in, in this busy world that people are just running around, we, I guess, end up missing people, you know, just seeing, seeing a bunch of ants running around and, and just being quiet for a bit is, has just maybe rekindled that, that passion for people in me. And I think... You know, that is just so important, you know, to spend time with your neighbors, know who your neighbors are, what's happening in their lives. Not right. Okay. I think what's, what's been amazing now is we haven't been rushing around from pillar to post. So we've, we've also been a bit more quiet. We've, we've experienced that, that beauty, you know, of just sleeping outside under the stars with the kids or 
not being rushed. So I think a bunch of bunch of things, but thank you for helping me to think about these things. Yeah, I think there's just so much good that's going to come out of this. Mm. Are you, I mean, you, you were also alluding to like a post COVID world. Mm. Yes. Is that right? So it's not, so not just like personal principles in terms of the world, what's going to change. Yeah, that as well. Yeah. yeah so I, I think that principles remain principles and I don't think a lot is going to change in the world. In all likelihood, you know, a year or two from now, people are, are going to have completely forgotten about this. But the economic impact will remain. So online education businesses would have had a great injection. Some biomedical businesses, pharmaceutical businesses will be on a great wicket. You know, airlines, a lot of these businesses will have some some problems and countries will have debts that people will have to repay and that, you know, all of these things, it's so difficult to predict what the impact of that would be. But I'm hoping that that God, or I, I, I know that God will use this to, to bring something beautiful out in people. And um, the most amazing thing that's happened in this time is people have stood outside at night, look at the stars and they thought, you know, who made this? Why am I here? We are so small, you know, and, and I think that that is beautiful. Like people have just connected again. Uh, like there was this unity, the whole world was facing the same issue. Okay. We are all, we all realize that we in this together in our, in our neighborhood, every night at 830, people would blow shofars. They're still doing it. Oh. And it is, it is such an eerie feeling. Like you stand outside and suddenly the shofar starts to blow. And just the whole valley, everybody's blowing these shofars. So I don't know how the world's going to look going forward, but, but I'm sure that people's hearts will have, would have changed. A lot of people experience something in this time that they will never forget. I think it's so true. Many of our most solid, in inverted commas, foundations have been shook by what's happened. And I think the world at mm -hmm. large, society at large, one of the big pillars that we see as mostly fixed and solid is, is the economy. And um, as you say, the economy will take a lot of hits. Um, there will be a lot of pain and it will probably take a long time for it to recover. But it really is such a great time. And I've seen it personally as well, just to remind myself, I'm forced to remind myself that my, you know, my provider is, is not a job or paycheck, it's a person. And that person knows me intimately. And that person knew me even before I was born. And um, I think, as you say, a lot of people are just standing under the stars with enough time to actually just let their mind wander while staring at it, thinking, you know, why am I here? And I think that is... Um, there's such a lot of good that will come out of that. And um, that's why I've also just been reminded that we have such a responsibility to just uh, portray and uh, exude that hope that's within us as we encounter mm -hmm. people. Yeah, a, a friend of mine had a very nice image, basically saying that what's happened here is like this nice fire was burning and someone came and just kicked all the logs <laughs> away. And now our job's going to be we had to roll up our sleeves and put this fire back together again, you know, kindle that, kindle those flames again, get it going. And it's a real responsibility. This is not, this is the time to stand up and be counted. I think in 50 years from now, okay, probably no, no guarantees that we'll, <laughs> we'll be around then, but, but the question will be asked, what did you do in this time? What did your business do? What did you do? How did you survive? Who did you help? How did, you know, what transformation did take place there? And um, so there's going to be a lot of need, but also massive opportunity to partner with God in this. I agree with you. I think, as you say, luckily we know we have God to help us put those logs back, um, but it will be a challenge. It will be a big job. 
but we will look back and probably be sure to see what what God did in and through us in this time and in the world um, and how he turned people back to him I think that is encouraging maybe as a as a final parting shot and question to you I learned two incredible phrases from you to be honest the one I did know um, and her and I did hear of it uh, before uh, you mentioned it to me but I actually came to uh, learn the impact of it um, after you uh, elaborated on it. So that one is, you know, you need to swing for the fences. And the second saying that just stuck with me since our conversation at our Olaf Tyrannis chapter meeting in Cape Town in March 2019 was that you should never miss an opportunity to, to be fabulous. And um, I'm just interested to hear, if you don't mind sharing with us, how do you plan um how do you see swinging for the fences and how do you plan to never miss an opportunity to be fabulous in a post-covid world <laughs> yeah i will i will refer back to to what i what i said about us being so risk averse which is in direct opposite basically to 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 what you said there about swinging for the fences and also in in it's also not in line with what god wants us to do it's really you know putting ourselves out there taking risks uh, being bold so so i will just go back to that and say in the times that come we have to resist the urge to to just manage risk and we have to resist the urge to not let um, resources flow through us you know we that we we shouldn't become that blockage we should we should let it flow we should take risks and be bold i fully back that and i think uh, never before has it been so important for us to not miss an opportunity to be fabulous not for our sake but for for those around us and the people we interact with on a daily basis that might not know this hope that we have within us uh, living inside of us so um i'll be there alongside you swinging for the fences trying my best and uh, luckily we have each other and and god to to lead us through all of these unknown unknowns so thank you franz i really appreciate your time i appreciate your wisdom insight and just for sharing so generously and in such a transparent manner really just appreciate it and um, i know this conversation will add a lot of value on a lot of levels to everyone who listens to it so thank you so much thanks Ivan. i enjoyed it appreciate it Thank you.